Wow, it's, it's, it's in the afternoon. I want to hear some excitement. How's everybody <laughs> doing today? That is much better, much better. Well, I'm uh, BJ Colvin, uh, Director of ITS um, at King County Library System, and I'm working with Erica. You get me first. Uh, so for those people who are joining us in Zoom, I apologize. Uh, I've worked in IT for a long time. I have ADHD. I don't stand still. They've told me if I walk past this white line, uh, you won't see me. I will walk past the white line. So I apologize in advance. Uh, I'm going to do the first portion here, kind of talk through, and I'll be around kind of at the end if there's any questions. Um, I like talking, so I apologize uh, to Erica if I take into too much of her time. It is dangerous to give me a microphone. Um, I'm going to be talking about our experience using Evergreen and BiblioCommons, uh, and then I'll hand over to Erica after we kind of go through some of my slides. She'll talk about that kind of patron experience and really some of the depth of BiblioCommons. So the first thing that I must caveat is it's been a while. I'm a director, which means that I, by nature, am kind of dumb at IT anymore. I, as soon as I got the title, all that knowledge went out the window. Um, so I'm not a technical expert anymore. I can still probably program a PBX. And I also do come from schools initially, not from libraries. So the library world is new to me in the last two years. So if I use the wrong words, you know, please let me know. Um, I'm not in the trenches anymore. Uh, in fact, you know, definitely not on the roll of sleeves. The most that I really got into Evergreen in my prior role at KCLS was probably rolling the bricks and making Bill Erickson panic. So if you have beyond my basic explanation, I'll go through questions about the deep technical underlying, uh, please hunt down Bill or Bradley Bonner afterwards. Bradley, you're welcome. So um, just how does it work with the integration between Evergreen and BiblioCommons? And so we provision two servers, two Tomcat servers, and we work very closely with the BiblioCommons team. Uh, we run and own those servers, but BiblioCommons has access to it. Their technical team has access to those servers and really manages it. Um, and what that allows for is that kind of combination of maintenance. There is some communication that also occurs via the Evergreen API, and I'll talk more in our future plans of how we want to work with BiblioCommons to make some changes. But basically, this is the fundamental architecture. So, and I should caveat because Bill made sure to tell it, it's not a direct connection to Evergreen. It is into the databases. So uh, I don't actually see Bill in the audience, so I can say lots of things and he won't get in trouble. Sweet. So that's basically the basic architecture uh, behind the connection. Now, what I want to talk about a little bit is the pros and cons because, you know, it's interesting. I think a lot of people ask us, you know, you use a open source ILS, but then your discovery layer is not open source. Uh, and there are some pros and cons to that. Uh, the number one thing that I think of in my role as the tech director uh, is the user experience, whether that's our internal user experience or our external user experience. And one thing that I see that's really a pro uh, to BiblioCommons, it's really not on the slide, uh, is I think that it benefits our user experience both internally and externally uh, in a lot of different ways. Um, one thing I will say very strongly about BiblioCommons overall is they really have received high quality and responsive uh, support. For example, we recently did an evergreen upgrade, um, which had some problems on the BiblioCommons connector. We were able to get their engineers on the phone on a weekend at I think 7 a.m., um, you know, which is not the time most people wanna be awake on a Sunday. Um, and they were able to dive in and get us uh, up and running really quickly. Oh, Bill's coming into the room, so I have to be nice again. So uh, access to specialized UI skill sets and research. So one thing that we've run into is my team, my IT team is very good at understanding the work that librarians do, really understanding those intrinsic needs. My ILS administrator has his uh, MILS, um, really a good deep understanding of what our internal users need and how their workflows work. What we don't always have is an understanding of how our patrons engage and interact. Um, and that is really one of the things that we benefit by having this partnership with BiblioCommons is they bring a lot of expertise on that front to make sure that we're, our, what we're doing is very easy for our end users. At the end of the day, you know, I want one, somebody like my wife who does not ever think about libraries beyond what I talk and wanting to get her book uh, that whatever the newest novel that's come out uh, for the romance novel series she's reading, um, she wants to just be able to get that in her hands and she doesn't want to have to think about it. And the UX for BiblioCommons is very easy to use. I actually will often, when we're making changes, make my wife do something. Recently, I had to make her a purchase request. So it's very easy and they bring that really deep skill set. 
And that's where it allows us to focus our internal systems and improvement. So we get to spend more of our time talking about how do we make our staff's jobs easier? How do we make things really streamlined internally? Because we're not having to think about some of this work. And when we hosted our own uh, discovery layer, it really ate up a lot of the oxygen in the room. And I think I have that at the end here. But it was one of those things that was just taking up a lot of time and we weren't able to focus on some of the fundamentals behind Evergreen. So it gives us the access to a lot of their other integrated tools. We use, we use I think, most of the, the whole product suite of Biblio Commons. Um, we're actually uh, partners in some new development that's going on as well. Uh, and those tools are very handy. So we do our events uh, management, we do our room booking, we use a lot of their other tools through Biblio Commons that's just very streamlined and it's integrated in a well uh, way. Um, we do engage with them as a development partner. So we do do some funding with them. So we just got a foundation grant to do some data work. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit in our future plans. Um, and then again, you know, as I was just talking with Bill at breakfast this morning, what was the biggest advantage of moving to Biblio Commons? And it was that this part took up so much air in the room. And so we can really focus on that internal staff. Now, there are some cons. And when Erica asked me to present with her, I told her that I might not be nice because it's gonna be very honest. Uh, I've talked through the pros and so here's some of the cons. Um, anybody who's ever worked with me or, or for me knows that I do not like to be told what to do and when to do it. Uh, and Biblio Commons has some very strict notifications around when we can upgrade Evergreen. And I do not like that because I wanna be able to do upgrades when I want to do them. Uh, we do tend to comply. There's been a couple times where I've uh, kind of overridden the timelines and said, it's going to work, trust us. Um, and I know that smaller systems wouldn't have that advantage. Um, and I do dislike that we have to give so much notice. I believe for certain upgrades, it's up to three months advance notice. And that is, you know, there, there's reasons behind it. They want to be able to know and prepare and make sure that their version is compatible, um, especially because we, we do run, you know, a little bit ahead on some of our feature sets. So that's one thing that really drives me crazy is I don't like having to delay anything uh, based on someone else's schedule. Uh, there's sometimes we run into unexpected compatibility issues. That's gonna be really common with any system. Um, you know, that error that I talked about, they were rarely responsive, was unexpected. So it does come up occasionally. And there's sometimes where we want to uh, integrate something uh, in a change and Biblio Commons doesn't have that feature yet as well. Um, one thing that I always does bother me is Evergreen is one of the, the smaller systems that connects into Biblio Commons right now. There's not a ton of Evergreen libraries. So there are some features that we're told doesn't exist yet. Um, we work really closely with Biblio Commons when those come up and we want to resolve them. And they've been really responsive, but it does run into there um, occasionally. Uh, and it can be challenging to get on any vended systems development list. Um, that means also there's competition for development for evergreen specific needs. If we want to make a change and it's not on the roadmap already, or it's in, you know, it competes with another need for say Polaris, we could run into issues there. Um, any third party integrations, this is not just talking about Biblio Commons, but this is with any vended system, it adds complication and latency. So there's the change management approach uh, and support requirements around that. So we do spend a lot of time making sure that things uh, work whenever we do a thir third party change. So when we're making a change to how we're handling holds, for example, there's the testing involved, there's change management, there's notification. So that does add um, some kind of friction, but I would say that it's overall kind of a net benefit on my support team side. Um, and then the last piece that's really a con is there can be confusion around where the problems occur, uh, both internally and with their support team. Um, so sometimes it's, uh, there's uh, the finger pointing game. Has anybody dealt with that with any vended system? Actually, I didn't ask earlier, how many of you are technical staff? Can I get it kind of hands? Okay, and uh, libraries focused. And who's confused about what they do for their job? There's a couple, okay, okay. That's actually a good bit of the room. Bradley, I know what you do for your job. I just, <laughs> so where that, is a problem and is, you know, especially with complex systems is we run into, it's like, where is the problem when something's not working? Um, I would say we ran into this on kind of multiple fronts um, across the board. So it's not the end of the world, but it's just something to be aware of is you're going to connect to any system, whether that's vended or an open source that you're hosting yourself. And one of the advantages is we do host our own Evergreen instance. And so we're able to work through this a little bit easier. 
I would say that if you were using a hosted, this probably even uh, adds another layer of complexity. So what I'd like to also talk about is kind of the future plans. So what, what, do, what does it look like and what are our plans going forward with Biblio Commons? The one I am most excited for is our data project collaboration. So this is the grant funded project. So KCLS, we have an enterprise data, in, uh, data warehouse. We have a full-time data engineer. And so data is really critical for what we're doing. We just actually yesterday at our board meetings, um, the board of KCLS voted to go finds free based on a really robust set of data that we were able to collect on um, patron behavior. So there was a lot of data work that went into that. And so data is critical to what we're doing. So one of the things we're working on is that data project. And we're, one of the requests that we got is we got direct access. Some of the things Biblio Commons was doing on this project was really focused on giving their other libraries more information about kind of general behaviors and trends, giving kind of more available data out there. Uh, we uh, at KCL said, wait, great, we love that. It's really positive. We just want access to the data as well. And we were able to work through that with Biblio Commons. So we're gonna get that kind of direct data but that data is going to be kind of this conglomeration of shared information to make more intelligent decisions across the board. And I'm really excited to see how that turns out. Uh, we're also working with, um, you know, Biblio Commons right now on some sp sponsor development initiatives. So there's some needs that we want that are very specific to KCLS. We're large, we have Evergreen, and we really want to see certain features implemented. Uh, largely because we have a more advanced technical team. And so we're working to develop some sponsored initiatives. So we're gonna pay for certain development. And so the fact, I actually think this is a positive. Uh, most companies, most vended institutes say, I want, I want these problems to go away. Tell me what I need to pay for it to go away. Um, being a larger system, you think that would work and it doesn't. Uh, I've offered vendors in some situations a lot of money. Does anybody here use Envisionware? I've offered them a lot of money to fix some of my problems and they've said no every time. So uh, the fact that Biblio Commons is willing to work with us on that, because it's a benefit to everybody else, um, is really critical. Uh, we're looking at this API enhancements. I would really like to see Tomcat disappear. I would like to not have to run those two servers. And so we're in conversations with Biblio Commons. How can we get it to go away and rely purely on the Evergreen API? And so there's really some good conversations happening there. Uh, and then we want to move towards some direct patron notification management. We really want patrons to be able to manage the notification they receive directly. Um, we have that kind of functionality would exist in Evergreen. You know, we can have that API expose and make those discussion and build, nod your head if I'm saying this right. Perfect. Um, and we really want, but that requires some development on BiblioCommons side for the way that Evergreen does that. So that's something that we're working on and really developing. So I'll, that was really what I had prepared. So I'll hand it over to Erica and I'll be around for questions afterwards as well. Do you guys have any questions now for BJ? I mean, we can both be any point. I like talking, so. <laughs> okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm super uh, grateful. And I should say that also, I obviously really want BJ and everyone to be really honest about everything, right? We're all librarians. We all wanna make sure that our systems like work, but also be honest about what's not working so that like vendors and other folks can work on all that. Um, and in terms of the connector, we do have a completely cloud-based connector for Polaris and um, Sierra. So the, the system is there. And honestly, it's a win-win for all of us because we also don't want that Tomcat server sitting out there because it's just another point of failure, right? So, um, okay. But what I really want to talk about is the patron experience. So um, what Biblio Commons tries to do, and I should say that Biblio Commons first started as a youth literacy initiative, and it was a nonprofit. And um, so what we're trying to do is take the best of public libraries, that serendipitous discovery, the like beautiful library spaces, the idea that you come into a library to feel refreshed and to find something, you know, um, there's a, a, a scientist, a data scientist, um, Shane Lopez, and he talked about how, um, people come into libraries looking for their future selves. You know, it's their aspirations and how, even if that aspiration is, I'm gonna go to Italy this summer, so I need to learn Italian, or I'm gonna have a baby, or I'm gonna get married, or maybe I just want something great to read this weekend and my time is very valuable to me, so I need this to be a sure bet, a read. Um, however that works, but then we also wanna marry that to the best of the web. And we're very lucky in Toronto, we have like an amazing, um, uh, amazing pool of incredible tech folks. And many of those folks want to work um, in a world where um, a mission driven company, you know, where they're making the world a better place. Uh, so we wanna take the best of public libraries, the best of the web, 
and then create these digital experiences worthy of your public library. But we're only working in this, the public patron layer. Uh, so just in terms of what King County has, like Vijay said, um, King County uses our web product. So everything is fully integrated. Um, our Biblio events system, our Biblio core, this is the catalog that sits on top of Evergreen, um, Biblio apps um, and Biblio email, which um, is email marketing um, and it's all streamlined. But um, this isn't just about everything being streamlined. It's also having the actual patient experience be truly integrated. And what I mean by that is that for too long, we've had these silos, right? We have the website, we have the catalog, we have the events, we have these other things. Um, but the patrons don't care about any of that. You know, if you think about any other website you go to, you don't have this weird Frankenstein-y world of like, which kind of door did I have to go down? So here I'm at King County and here's this nice blog post, but as you see, they're pulling in content from the catalog, but the hold buttons are right there. You don't have to go over to the catalog to place a hold. And that might seem like a little, um, like maybe somewhat insignificant, but in terms of user experience, one more click, you know, that keeps us that way they're staying on this content that the staff created. So that's just one example of how we're integrating across those different services. Um, as I said in my, when I was talking my lightning talk, um, the best thing in some ways is to see this patron feedback. And I'll show some more patron feedback in a second. I can't say that it's all like this, but the bad patron feedback also informs us. Sorry, I'm really talking with my hands. Um, so we love this kind of feedback um, where, you know, the patrons really gush about how good things are. And they also tell us when things are not working. So having this direct line to patrons is really critical to everything Biblio Commons does. Um, you can't build a, a system that works great for patrons and only listen to librarians. I mean, I'm a librarian, they listen to librarians too, but you have to listen to patrons. We have to watch what patrons do, do user testing directly with patrons, and that keeps us very busy. So we don't ever wanna create an ILS. We just wanna focus on this layer and there's so much work to be done. Um, so just in terms of um, how Biblio Commons works, so we sit on top of the ILS, we integrate with um, most of the main ILSs that are at play in the US and the Canada. So any library who has Biblio Commons at least has the BiblioCore catalog. So libraries 100% can have, like maybe they run their own website or their own events or they use another vendor for those things. If a library has Biblio Commons, they have the BiblioCore catalog because that ILS integration is really key to what we do. So we work with over 400 public libraries across the US and Canada, and then one really nice library in New Zealand. Um, but lots of the, you know, big, amazing libraries, but um, also working with mid-sized libraries, um, uh, and we've really moved more into consortia and mid-sized libraries over the last mm, three or four years. So in terms of libraries that use the BiblioCore catalog uh, with Evergreen, uh, the BC libraries, Sitka libraries, uh, Idea Lab, Innisfil, and then St. Thomas um, in Ontario, and then libraries that use the whole, like, digital experience platform, so that includes the website, catalog, et cetera, King County Library System, obviously Kenton County in uh, Kentucky and Grand Rapids in Michigan. Um, so sometimes, and understandably, right, libraries have very uh, limited budgets. Folks will say, well, what's the ROI on Biblio Commons? Because, you know, it's not, it's not free, open source. Um, it is, there's a, you know, it's a subscription with software, software as a service subscription. Um, but we did pay a consultant to do an analysis of IMLS data over 10 years. And while we can't say this is causation, we can say it correlates. So basically, when you take IMLS data um, over 10 years and you subtract out libraries that have, you know, we subtract out um, like budget and geography and location and other um, variables that could affect this, um, libraries that had BiblioCommons saw a 39% increase in circulation over their peer libraries and 9% um, increase in visits over their peer libraries, even though this is an online service entirely. So um, again, this is just one way we're trying to show ROI. This is part of the data project that BJ was talking about. We really want to be able to show more specific data around how do we prove that we are deepening patron engagement and how does that affect our services and how, do, how can we help th that with libraries? So one of the advantages of BiblioCommons is this is all we do, right? All we do is the patron layer. So we've really been able to have continual product growth and that also helps everybody. So, you know, again, even if Biblio Commons isn't something that you can consider at this point, um, like in 2012, we worked with Seattle Public, Boston Public and New York Public. And we basically screen scraped overdrive to create integrated borrowing. I don't know how many people were around in 2012, but 
it used to be that integrated borrowing for your e-content wasn't a thing. Um, and so by doing that, we were able to then work with OverDrive and they're like, please don't do that. We would rather build an API. And everybody wanted the APIs, right? And again, it's hard to remember back if you weren't around then, like APIs from the e-content vendors were not a thing. And so by, by pooling these resources across big public libraries of like, this is what our patrons need, we can all make a better situation for patrons, regardless of which software you use. Um, so again, we have this whole dedicated team. We're about 50 people, it depends. Sometimes it's around 60 um, of people who really care about public libraries. And this includes developers and engineers, product managers. All of our product managers are librarians. The director of product um, came from industry and she's worked in a lot of different industries around uh, building brand engagement, or sorry, brand loyalty and customer engagement. All right, we have UX designers, QA engineers. And I think these are some of the things that, that you, know, you just aren't gonna be able to have in a lot of open source systems. Like, um, you know, part of the advantage of paying us to do this product is that we build in all these like industry best practices and make sure that, for example, our QA includes accessibility um, processes as well. So they're checking to make sure every release is accessible. Um, customer experience, support and training. Um, and uh, this also includes one of our co-founders who was there from the very beginning, Mar Marty Terrell. If anyone knows Biblio Commons, it was started by Marty along with Beth Jefferson and um, Patrick Kennedy. Um, and then it was acquired by Valeris in 2020. Um, but we've been able to keep the core team and um, really sort of operationalize what Biblio Commons does. Um, and then even more importantly than the team is our amazing pets. So, um, I, you know, I, these, this is, they're really a big part of our lives because we talk about them all day long and we have a dog in a Slack channel, but um, just like with anyone, you know, the team is really, really close and we all feel really uh, close to each other through the pandemic um, and sharing our dog and cat pictures. But every single feature release has UX uh, resources attached. These are two of our UX designers. Um, and I just wanted to go and I'll fly through these slides, but this is some of what we can do when this is all we do, right? When all we do is focus on the patient experience, we can have very um, robust metho methodology around our design processes. So um, whenever we're going to, to release a new feature or release you know, a new product or a new version. So for example, um, all this great patron feedback that we get, you know, hundreds of thousands of pieces of content come through with patron feedback. Our uh, team can look through all that. And then we can also do a competitive analysis across the library world. So um, for example, over the last, I would say five years, there's been so much more com competition in the library discovery layer which is fantastic for all of us, right? It means we can um, justify a lot more R&D on our side. Like competition is good for everyone and it's definitely gonna be good for patrons because every time that like Mark builds something in Aspen and we're like, Ugh, then we're like, okay, then we need to at least level set that, right? And then like, you know, everyone will copy each other and we'll just keep making better experiences for everyone. So we really pay attention to what's happening in the competitive analysis. Um, and then also comparable analysis across um, other best of web kind of experiences. So um, if it's a um, event system or if it's a calendar system or something like that, we wanna make sure that we're comparing and, and seeing what the rest of the web is doing. And we wanna to conform to those standards that are being um, developed. Um, we do a lot of user interviews and surveys. Uh, we review heat maps and user journeys. We do wireframes, uh, we do mockups, prototypes, usability testing, and then we report all this out. And this wasn't always true for Biblio Commons. In the early days, there was a lot of just do it. This is what I want. And then the front end developers would be like, I do it, you know. But now all this process is there and this has been benefiting patrons and making sure we can scale out our services. Um, so if you're interested in the latest UX webinar, um, Ashley just gave a webinar on how to conduct user testing and creating extraordinary patron experiences. And she also uses our new um, My Events feature um, as sort of to test that. So um, a lot of also what we wanna do is give back to the the community and you know share these user testing um, experiences and things like that. So this is actually a link to um, her latest webinar that you can watch as a recording. Um, and then the other thing about Biblio Commons and you know something else that we're doing so that the library can really focus on the staff side is to really focus on inviting inclusive accessible spaces. Um, obviously it, accessibility is vital to libraries and any physical building would be built with accessibility but it is um, somewhat shocking how uh, low accessibility can be in the online experience from the app. If you've ever tried to use an app with through the screen reader, 
um, or if you've ever tried to use like the online experience through a screen reader, or just, um, it's not just screen readers, but also just someone who is um, low literacy. Low literacy folks do not need piles and piles and piles of text, right? Librarians love a wall of text. They're like, give it, give it to me. I love it. I, you know, but that's not how patrons search. They, scanning is very hard for someone who's low literacy. Um, so um, we have this commitment that the online experience must always be welcoming and inclusive to everyone everywhere, period. Um, but that is easier said than done, but we really put in the work. So what do we do? We are uh, WCAG uh, 2.1 level AA compliant. You know, this will continue to move on as those st standards change. Um, all staff have training on accessibility and that's required annually. Of course, the developers have even more than the rest of us do, but everyone is trained on it annually because those standards also change and technology changes. Um, accessibility is baked, in, baked into our quality assurance testing scripts and automation. Uh, we also work with Level Access, which is an accessibility consultancy because we can't know either, everything either and they help keep us up to date and we share that information out across the library world. We have our VPAT published and available. If you want to see it, um, let me know. I'm happy to share it. And just so you know, all vendors should provide that um, so you know what they are accessible on. And then also we share those guidelines and best practices with libraries because obviously if a library is building a website like King County, um, there's a lot of parts of that service that um, that they're having control over the accessibility in terms of like color compliance and things like that. So we share best practices with libraries and we also do a review to make sure that um, they're not making a decision they didn't mean to. Um, that's not really an example of King County because they're obviously awesome, but like for a smaller library, it's just hard to keep track of everything. So um, I have this let's search. It's not really a search, but I just wanna show an example. This is Kenton County's um, Evergreen instance, um, OPAC. So I'm gonna search for Colleen Hoover, wildly popular author. As you can see here, um, it's fine, um, but like there's no ferberization, there's no group search. I can't see all the formats. If I wanted the large print, I don't know if they have it. Um, I don't really know what the relevancy in terms of why hopeless hit first. Um, so, you know, it's okay. This is the Biblio Commons version. So a lot of things are built in here, one, um, I see the title, I see the star ratings that comes from the Biblio Commons community. Um, I see all the titles, or sorry, all the formats that are available and then they're color coded. Also a lot of UX design went into this to make sure this was easily scannable. So again, everything looks super clean and easy to use, but lots and lots of variations happened here before we got to this one. Uh, and then, um, so then if I wanna click on the actual title, um, again, I see all the formats. And again, a lot of UX went into this work. Um, so the way the formats show up and there's a lot that goes into showing just enough information, but not too much, but just what people need. And again, that's why we do all the studies and iterate from there. And then if I scroll down the page, again, very visual, having not as much text because people scroll and look for images, not for walls of text. Um, so it features the staff list, really featuring the staff voice that include that title, you might like, this is pulling from novelists. So just like other discovery layers, we're pulling in from a lot of different uh, sources. This is Kenton County's uh, website. Um, and so they went live last year. And um, this is just a quote from Nicole, the digital branch librarian. Um, you know, I think um, of course King County is like one of the sort of titans of libraries, right? They do big things, they have a huge staff. Um, they're well-funded, they have a great foundation. Um, but I also just wanna mention this is Kenton County in Kentucky, um, a much smaller library. And Nicole was like, you know, Biblio Commons really makes everything so much easier and it's totally worth it because so much is coming. So just that best of both worlds, the open source on the ILS, you can have choice. Um, hopefully it's less expensive than the other ILS options that are out there, but then having sort of a best class um, patron experience. Um, so some of the innovation, what are we doing? Okay, this goes to 315, is that right? So this is a project we've been working on with King County and Chicago. So um, a lot of what we're doing is innovation and research in that patron space. So the problem we're trying to solve, or one of the problems we're trying to solve is public libraries provide so much fantastic content and events and online resources and all the things, right? Um, you know, you, have, you loan out dulcimers, you know, you loan out fishing poles. How would anyone know this, right? Um, and so how can we make sure that patrons discover everything the library offers? So in this case, it's just a cute uh, blog post on kawaii crafting, but this might really make someone's day, right? But if it's not featured on the homepage, how are they gonna ever find it again? 
Um, and of course, even a very content rich homepage like the Chicago Public that has almost like an infinite scroll, you can't feature everything the library offers on the homepage. But at the same time, some ways, some libraries have tried to solve that problem by saying, well, we'll put everything into search. But you can't search with a, what you don't know exists. You know, you're not just gonna randomly search. Maybe the library is doing dulcimers these days. We don't know. So we need to find a way to put everything the library offers into the patron search path. So um, this was our solution. Again, this is one of many solutions, um, but to put image rich promotions right into the path based on what the patrons search for, but don't rely on keywords. We need to have taxonomies and subject headings and have more robust discovery because when you just use keywords to um, uh, pull these things up, you get a lot of missed hits and you miss a lot of, um, a lot of content too. So in this case here, my Kauai crafting blog post comes up because I did a related search, um, but you can search, you can use this for anything. So this only works with libraries that have BiblioWeb because we need this image rich card that pulls through the content that staff has already created on BiblioWeb. So staff do all this great work, create the cards with the content, those pull automatically into the catalog based on the patron search path. The other thing is that we still know, and this is still true coming out of the pandemic, um, patrons still go directly into the catalog. You know, yes, they'll browse your events, your, your location, but the catalog is still the number one search of where, um, the path that they go down. So this is the best path to find this in. So we started this with a pilot with King County and Chicago with King County. We also added some AI work into it. Um, and then uh, this is, so based on what we've seen, these do get click throughs and it does increase patron awareness of all that offers. Um, so this will be going into production for King County, Chicago and um, Pima County sometime in Q2. Um, so it's already there, but it's only right now hitting about 10% of patrons as we continue to test it. So it's gonna ramp up to 100%. Um, and so it could be events, it could be online resources, it could be blog posts, it could be services, it could be uh, uh, staff uh, lists. Um, but we actually did have an early prototype of this. And this is still live for libraries that don't have BiblioWeb, um, where we call this featuring catalog. And so the links came in, but links are not enough. And just having images that aren't associated with the, the content weren't enough either. So that's where our next phase was to take it to the BiblioWeb side and pull that content in. So we did have this and this is still live. It's not that we think this is bad, it just wasn't enough. Um, and that's why we really felt like we needed the images. But if you are a library that uses Biblio Commons, these, this is not going away if you uh, don't have Biblio Web. However, this is coming to all Biblio Web libraries in 2023. So this is again, um, you know, yes, Biblio Commons is something that you, you know, have an annual subscription for, but you also get all the advantages of having Biblio Commons. So this will automatically roll out to everyone. And so we're really appreciative of libraries like King County and Chicago and others who help us to test it and sometimes help fund this development, but then it goes out to everyone. So all ships rise together. Um, another big project, and this is what Vijay had mentioned, is patron engagement measurement, uh, metrics and measurement. So when Nina, who is our new director of product, she's been there for now two years, when she first came to Biblio Commons, you know, she comes from industry, she works in all these different places where she's um, deepened um, customer engagement. And she said, well, you know, what's your North Star metric? How do you prove that what you're building actually increases patron engagement. And we're like, we don't have that. <laughs> and so she's like, cool, what do libraries use? And we're like, nope, um, there's lots of data, right? That libraries keep, but there's no, not one North Star metric that we all look at and we measure in terms of like, how can we move this needle? So um, she has been assembling best in class data team, working with the founding partners and our founding partners for this project are King County, Columbus Metro in Ohio, uh, San Francisco Public Library, and Pima County in Arizona. So uh, she has started to work on the research and sending out information to the founding partners around how we're gonna identify this North Star metric. And then we will deliver on this ongoing data modeling and reporting of best practices across the network. And then also continuing improving our own products um, and uh, by measuring with this North Star metric. And the, this idea of this metric isn't something we have to wait for a year for. It's something that we can look at, you know, on a weekly or monthly basis to see like, are we moving this needle? Are we deepening engagement? You know, does someone use the library and then they continue to have success with the library and continue to engage? So, you know, we want this sustained, you know, sticky patrons idea and thriving public libraries. So very big ambitious project. We could never do it without um, amazing libraries like King County, San Francisco, um, Columbus, Pima, um, but it also then, 
by doing this library, this work together, we make it better for like all the libraries using Biblio Commons and hopefully public libraries um, more broadly as well. So patron feedback, as I mentioned, I love looking at patron feedback um, and this direct patron feedback is um, really is encouraged. Every time a patron is logged into a Biblio Commons site, they see this feedback box at the bottom. And that feedback, of course, is shared directly with the library. Um, also, they can run reports on it. Um, and then within the feedback report, patrons select their type of feedback. So it is self-selected. Um, they add a comment, but it also gives us user information, a page link to the feedback form, and then browser uh, device and things like that so we can help troubleshoot. Um, we've received hundreds of thousands of feedback. Last time I looked, it was over 500,000 pieces of feedback. And in just Q1 of this year, King County submitted, their patrons at least, submitted 266 individual notes of feedback. That was just in the first quarter of this year. So I just did a quick breakdown. Um, so we had 20% uh, complaints, 19% compliments, 15% feature requests, 41 feature problems, and 5% uh, uh, search issues. Now that said, these categories are defined by the patrons when they submit, and sometimes patrons pick kind of weird categories for what they submitted, but all this feedback is helpful to us. Um, now, sometimes the feedback has nothing to do with the software, which is fine, right? Um, so sometimes it's like, when will the library hours be back to pre-pandemic uh, you know, hours? Uh, we, we can't fix that, but that way at least you know, this, the library has that feedback come from their patrons. Um, or I'm having a hard time finding my history. The new format is difficult to navigate. So we don't really have a new format. So this is an interesting comment from us as patron, but it's still helpful because we all we know is this person is having a hard time finding their borrowing history, right? So there's other things we can dive into here. Here's an example of a feature problem. Again, maybe not something that we can fix, but just as an example, um, or this is probably something that we should be on the lookout for. So if, they, if it's coming out, but it's not showing up in the app, something for us to pay attention to. Feature requests, we get a lot of feature requests, which is great. These are really helpful for us in terms of what um, patrons are actively looking for. And then the compliments. Um, so digital and real world services outstanding, continuous impressed, so pleased and easy to navigate, thank you. Uh, I like your website very much. It makes my life easy. Uh, you know, the library is the only tax I appreciate and like to pay on my property bill. Uh, excellent intuitive navigation. Even as a senior citizen, I can use the website easily, thanks to all who contribute this. This is actually something too that we saw during the pandemic, is that it's not enough to have something that where you can search. Patrons really needed something they could browse, like the shelves in the physical library. Otherwise, they don't, they're don't. they able to find the titles they need so that they can you know, use the library from a remote um, location. Uh, love this site. And then they have all these nice thank yous in different languages. Uh, absolutely adore our library, found out the curated list for topics and the librarian who helped me was gentle, professional and solicitous. Uh, so super nice and libraries change lives and librarians are badass. So, um, you know, patrons love libraries and we just want to create um, systems that make patrons like build those fabulous, warm, fuzzy feelings about the library and make sure that libraries continue to thrive, you know, tomorrow, next year and the next hundred years from here. So uh, we do have an online conference that's free to all public library folks. Um, so you can save the date there. And if you're interested in that, we do have an online newsletter. This is again, not specific to our partner libraries, which has a different newsletter, but this is basically just like, how can we share best practices for the online library for all public libraries? Um, because we want all public libraries to thrive regardless of which software you use. So um, that's all I have. And I have both of our email addresses there. What questions do you have for us? We do have consortia too. Um, so of the consortia, we have big and little. Um, Marinna is kind of an example of a smaller consortia. There's also PAC2 in Michigan. They're teeny tiny. They're on Symphony. Marinna is on uh, Sierra. Um, we, well, Sitka and uh, BC Cooperative, that's a consortia on Evergreen. Um, we work with LLC, which is Lakeland Library Co-op in Michigan. That's a pretty big cooperative. And then we're just now implementing, and I think they went live this week for staff preview with ENI Network. So ENI Network was using Sierra with uh, Viewfind, and now they've moved to BiblioCommons. And so 
um, like I said, I'm pretty sure staff preview went into effect this week. Yeah, so um, do I have to reset? Are there plans to move to a cloud connector for Evergreen? We would love to do it. It's, we would also, so it basically just comes down to like, is there a critical mass of libraries? It's, it's on our sponsored development list request with Biblio Commons right now. So it's one of the things that KCLS is looking at uh, helping to fund because we want the connector to go away, yeah. the current connector. We do too. Yeah, nobody likes it. <laughs> I mean, it's totally fine. It's just that like, it's just again, one more point of failure. And, and we do have it with Polaris and Sierra. So, and we're waiting for the other ILSs to build out the rest of their APIs, but Evergreen's a different story. So, what other questions? One thing I will say, you know, it showed up, I think a lot in Erica's, you know, presentation she was going through, you know, there's, and I, I think I kind of talked, there's, there's definitely been some IT headaches with Biblio Commons. I will never say there's not been, um, you know, there's sometimes, you know, um, you know, I'm bald and probably would have felt like I was going bald, you know, even more with some of the hiccups we did run into at points of times, but patrons have consistently really raved about the experience and the ease of use. I haven't seen a lot of really negative commentary around that. And I've seen a lot of positive, especially around those uh, with accessibility issues. And it's such a core portion of KCLS that it really kind of makes it worth any of the headaches that we do have to put up with. And I think that the headaches have gotten a lot less as time gone on. You know, I know there was a lot of headaches shortly after the acquisition uh, and a lot of those have gone away as we've worked really closely with Biblio Commons to just work on on the changes of, to support so and there's still some growth but you know we're working through that kind of you know together so um, that's what I think Biblio Commons really brings is that accessibility and that the UX is really just well designed and KCLS can't afford to hire a full-time UX designer so that's really a critical piece that we gain by that partnership And even if one library, I mean, I can think of a couple libraries that could probably afford our whole team, but like, um, but it was, still wouldn't be designed at scale. You know what I mean? Some of, some of it is able to, because we're able to get this feedback ag against, it's somewhere around 17. So of the libraries that are served by Biblio Commons libraries, it's somewhere around 17% of, of Canada and the US population right now. Um, and so, uh, that, that's a lot. That's a that's a lot of data for us to get and for us to make decisions around um, how to prioritize development. Any other questions? My email's up there. One thing that KCL is really proud of is uh, you know providing information in partnerships with other systems. So if you have questions after this, don't ever hesitate to reach out. Always happy to schedule a call or answer a couple emails back and forth, whether it's about this or any of the other uh, systems that we have. Yep, absolutely. And um, one other thing that came up because Aaron's back there, if you are on one ILS and you want to migrate to another, we can keep you on Biblio Commons the whole time. And we've done that for Boston Public, uh, St. Thomas, like we do it actually all the time. And it's, it's, it's no big deal. Like, just depends on the connectors. So, okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Vijay. Yeah, thank you.